Now with that, let me pick up where I left off last Wednesday night as we continue this teaching on was Joseph in Hope Temple. I'm not even up to Joseph yet. I probably won't be there for another few weeks. According to the Bible, Abraham was born in Ur of the Chaldees. That's Genesis 11, 31. That Abraham was definitely a Chaldean is also confirmed by Josephus. And he left the land of Chaldea where he was 75 years old. We looked at that. But Joseph in the ancient Hebrew book of Joshua report that Abraham's fame spread throughout the ancient world. It was attested to by several ancient historians, including Berosus, Hecatitus, and Nicholas of Damascus. According to the ancient book of Jasser, Abraham's father, Tira, was a high official in the government of Nimrod. This would further enhance this family's notoriety. It therefore becomes no stretch of imagination to notice that from this very city of Ur was excavated one of the most exquisite archaeological finds in the history of archaeology. Yes, from Abraham's ho old hometown was discovered an artifact depicting Abraham's attempted sacrifice of his son. Now let's call ram in the, in the thicket. And I'll read you why in a minute, why it's called that. When I first presented this information to you a couple years back, I relayed the information. I wasn't 100% convinced this is the ram in the thicket that we find in Genesis when Abraham was about to sacrifice his son, and I'll go to the story in a few moments. Angel stopped him and God provided a ram. So when this archeological find was found, people rushed into believing because Abraham was famous. His reputation preceded himself. He conquered kings that came to attack him or attacked others. And Abraham came to the rescue. So he was famous. There's no doubt about it. Not arguing that at all. But so famous that when this story was told, if it was told to the masses about the story of Isaac and the ram in the thick, thicket, did it spread as far as a thousand miles or more all the way back to his hometown Ur? Remember, he hasn't been in Ur in a long time. And so they created this ram in a thicket, which I'm about ready to show you. You could put it up to memorialize the story. That's the ram in a thicket. Now leave it up there while I keep reading. Some archaeologists dubbed the ram in the thicket as one of the most exquisite artifacts of antiquity. This treasure, found in the death pit of Ur, eloquently hints at Abraham's measureless fame and influence. Due to the acceptance of a woefully incorrect model of history, some scholars speculate this artifact was created in the memory of some ancient legend from Ur. They reason that the younger generous story of Abraham's attempted sacrifice must be a copy of that older tale, which I don't believe it is. But in our new model of time, things appeared reversed showing that traditionally accepted Egyptian history 
is a millennium too old. Our model also pushes Babylonian history forward by the same amount. In effect, it means that Abraham's era is older than Ur's death pit. It also means that by the time the artifact was created, the story of Abraham's offering up his son Isaac had already become legendary and was revered back in Ur, Abraham's old home. It is feasible this story made its way back to Ur. Or is it feasible that this story made its way back to Ur? Could Abraham's fame have been sufficient to propel stories of him all the way back to his hometown? This author believes so. Several ancient documents credit him as king, and numerous accounts tell of Abraham dealing with kings. In fact, Abraham's household defeated the combined forces of five Babylonian kings in Genesis 14:14. 14, 14. Perhaps the ram in the thicket attests that Abraham was not only a legend in his own time, was intimately known and loved back in the land of his birth. That's, I can't make that connection. I just can't. During the third millennium BC, it was a common motif in Babylonia to depict upright animals. Yet, since goats often stand on their hindquarters, the ram in the thicket may be misleading because many goats enjoyed rearing up. Well, that's true. But this is not complete, what I just read to you. The portion where I read were during the third millennium BC, it was a common motif in Babylonia to depict upright animals. And there was a reason behind that. We have enough information now to know the reason why they depicted these type of animals, or not just these type of animals, but animals in general, rearing up on their hind legs, is because there was a famine in the land. And it was not a famine that lasted just a few years. Some years it was worse than others, but food was scarce. And so they depicted the scarcity of the food and how it affected animals that they would have to raise on their hind legs to reach the most upright points they could reach to get the forage they needed to survive. We already know that about history. You come back to me now, then I'll tell you to put it back onto that. We already know that much in history. So even though, yes, it's true to a, it's only true to, to a certain extent what this author is relaying with the information that he gathered and now he's trying to convince others what this possibly could be. So a little fudging there, in other words. Could this, put it back on there, ram in the thicket. And the reason when why it's called that is because of a certain archaeologist discovery back in the 1930s in southern Iraq in the area that is known as Ur, which, by the way, is, was Abraham's original hometown. A British archaeologist by the name of Charles Leonard Woolley was excavating in a death pit of Ur. This was a graveyard site for kings and mobility from the land of Ur. Now, he found this object that you're seeing there on the screen guarding the tomb that he called, and he named it, Ram in the Thicket because it resembled a story in Genesis 22. Now, when I look at this, there's something missing. There's something missing. When I first was trying to digest all this material long ago, I was trying to lean, lean 
towards, okay, this is a very strong possibility that because of Abraham's fame, that this depicts the story concerning the almost sacrifice of Isaac and the loss of his life because God told Abraham to sacrifice him as a burnt offering, which didn't happen because God put a stop to it. But the thing is, this is, for that time period, a pretty good artifact, folks. It is a great find. The only problem is, in this particular depiction of what you see there on the screen, the creators of this piece didn't get the story right because the ram in the thicket had his horns tangled in the thicket, which this is not the pick. And like I said, there's a lot of now artifacts with rearing animals on their hind legs reaching forward, uh, reaching upward toward foliage that are dated back to the many, many, many years of the famine that that land was experiencing. So in other words, they were reaching for food. But Charles Willey found this object guarding the tomb, and he called it Ram the Thicket. But the image that you're seeing there is not so much of, of a ram. Goat or a goat, but more of a young bull that appears to be caught in the thicket. Now, it could not possibly be a bull either. So the possibility of it, it, it not being a ram there's a possibility of not being a goat, and there's a possibility of not being a young bull. We do know it's a horned animal. Just look at it. That's standing on its hind legs. That's trying to probably eating something on top of that bush. And this picture of this horned animal reaching for a high, high branch, some have dated about 2050 BC, which is about 200 years off of Abraham's time. Now, dating could change, and we'll get to some dating, and what's wrong with some dating techniques in the future. So I'm not really hung up about the dating, but I do know and like I said, there's enough evidences of animals reaching up, trying to feed due to a drought in the land and sometimes a famine that covered a period almost 300 years, friends. 300 years. Now, no one really knows what this symbol represents. Yes, it's nice to speculate that maybe Abraham's fame reached as far as the Mesopotamia area because there definitely was interaction, good and bad, with kings in that area. Now, is this a story, Genesis 22, with Abraham and Isaac that would be circulated? I'm not convinced of that either. It's almost kind of personal if you really think about it. What Isaac and Abraham experienced in Genesis 22. Now, there's some evidence that this horned animal could be a representation of Armar Utu, and I'll spell it to you. I'll spell it for you. A-M-A-R dash 
U T U. Write that down. A M A R dash U T U. So this horned animal could be a representation of Amar Utu, a horned animal, which represented one of their Mesopotamian slash Akkadian gods. It was a very common practice to offer human sacrifices, children, to this God for return of food. It was a very common practice. And I know it seems strange to us living in 2016 that people would actually go through this. It's unbelievable how much sacrificing of human life took place from those areas and then extended out to other areas. Anytime something was going wrong, the first thing they do is sacrifice children. That seemed the most go-to solution they had. And they would sacrifice to this, they would sacrifice to many gods, but one of the gods they would sacrifice more frequently to was the Amar Utu god. And the Amar Utu god was a horned animal. And remember, God despised that practice. He despised any practice in a, that practices a false religion of, that includes false gods. But on top of that, sacrificing people, children, it displeased them dearly. Now, some believe this horned animal reaching for the last morsel of food in this artifact symbolizes Armar Utud providing out of the scarcity of the land. Now, Come back to me now. I think you had enough of that picture. Let me read you some other things here. Utu. Arma Utu. Now, guess what Marduk, many of you have heard that. Marduk spells out in the Sumerian, literally. Arma Utu which means the calf, or the solar calf of Utu, the young bull of the sun. Now, Utu, an Akkadian rendition of Sumerian, U-D, or Ud, which leads to sun, or the Assyrian Babylonian Shamas, which is the sun, is none other than the sun god in Sumerian mythology. And who's that? Well, the son of the moon god is Nana. N A N N A. And the goddess, you had the sun god, which was, I mean, you had the, the sun of the moon god, Nana. And, of course, the goddess was Ningel, N-I-N-G-A-L. Of course, he had brothers and sisters and so forth. Now, some believe Nimrod was Marduk. And many, they had many different names that define certain characteristics of an individual that they would worship as godlike. And of course, it was started by the individuals that wanted to be worshiped as God back in that day. So Utu is the God of the sun, justice and application of the law and the knowing and the practice of, the, of all truth. And guess what he was depicted as always? wearing a horn helmet, a horn helmet. 
And of course, Marduk. Some believe he has 50 different names from that time period. And of course, that would translate and eventually changed during the course of time, even thinking that Moloch was one of the same with Marduk, the same god. Armar Utu, the calf of Utu. which would be the son of the moon god. And Nana would be the goddess Ningel. Interesting, isn't it? So in other words, this Armar Ututh was an extension of the moon god. And it depicted a horned animal or anything that's horned that's wearing a helmet. I found that interesting as I kept digging in and trying to figure out where this all fits in. So, then you get into the Hebrew. The word thicket in the Hebrew is savek. S-A-V-E-K, for those of you interested in writing all this down. Which means to entwine, or an entwining vine, tree, or bush. It's not really a bushy type plant, but it's a plant that is aggravating and you can get entwined in it. The word ram comes from, from an all-purpose root word in the Hebrew, and that is abal, A-V-A-L. So you have sevek, I mean, S-A-V-E-K, and you have aval, A-V-A-L which is a word for any animal with horns. It could be a goat. It could be a deer. It could be a ram. It could be a horned bull. Now, let me read you something else that's interesting. Taking all these words and considering all these words for ram and the thicket and looking at that picture, you can put it up again, the ram and the thicket picture, artifact, the Mesopotamian God, I believe, through my investigations, is the Armar Utud, and it was found guarding the death pit in Ur. Now, let me go to Genesis 22 and read you the story. Come back to me now. Now, you can go over your Bibles to Genesis 22 and read along with me. And this is, now we get to the part where this story really never lined up for me for several reasons. I'll touch on one or two of them tonight. I'm not saying it didn't happen. Of course it happened. But everybody writes about this story, commentators, authors, even preachers preach on this story. And of course, they always put a super spiritual connotation to it that if you disagree with it you consider a nut. I'm not saying I do disagree with some of the interpretations they have delivered concerning the story. But I say there's something else in this that no, we're not just 
grasping. We're not looking hard enough because there's some inconsistencies with this story that have bugged me since I was about 25, so many years now. Verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, or test, and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and settled his ass. Right there, from verse, in the verse 2 to verse 3, that bugs the heck out of me. There is no place in this story that says, wait, wait, did I hear you correct, Lord? You want me to sacrifice my son as a burnt offering? which means that I probably would have to slit his throat and do a proper burnt offering. I would have to cut him in pieces and light him on fire and let him burn. Think about it. How gruesome. What was God thinking? Yes, it was a test. But I'm not too sure that King James got it wrong either with tempt. And like I said, you could read right through the story and not knowing the history of that era, that time, thousands of years ago, this would not seem so uncommon of a request. You don't believe me? Look up the history of that period. It was unbelievably common to sacrifice people. Part of Abraham's life he grew up like believing, not believing necessarily, I'm not sure because I can't tell you for sure on that. But he obviously viewed and understood that sacrifice was an everyday common practice in the mystery Babylonian area of that world which he was living. And it became common practice in other areas too, including Haran and eventually centuries later even the children of Israel would practice it throwing their children on the burning hot idol Moloch arms first being burned by the touch of that hot iron probably idol and then consumed in the flames. So think about it. Take yourself out of 2016 and put yourself somewhere in the 1800 BC era of time when it was as common to sacrifice children as to go out and eat at a restaurant today. I know that sounds awful as an analogy, but I'm trying to make that point. This was not uncommon. I bet you never heard it that way put before. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went up to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go 
yonder and worship and come again to you. All right. What about these two young men? What were they thinking? Think about it. They knew it was going to be a burnt offering in the part of the worshiping that was going to take place. They saw the wood. They saw the fire. They knew the knife. Where was the lamb? What do you think was going through their mind? You could read these stories straight through, you could hear them preached. And of course, they always get to the super spiritual application of the type of Christ, of what he would do, which was prophesied, offer himself as the unblemished lamb to remove our sin. Now, I'm not arguing against that. I think the application should still be there. But should there be something in additional to what we've been taught all these years or heard? And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. Once again, a type of Christ. Christ carrying the cross, Isaac carrying the wood. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of, both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And this is no boy, young boy, by the way, it's depicted in the stories and the pictures. I believe he was about the same age of Jesus in his 30s. There's enough evidence of that to believe is somewhere, at the very least, 18 or 19, all the way up to somewhere in his mid-30s. <coughs> this is not like this little lad running around. And Abraham was already an old man. Isaac could have overtaken his father long enough to run away, if you really think about it. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Of course, some scholars believe here is a dual application. One, that God will provide himself, meaning that in the personage of Jesus, almost 2,000 years later, would come and he would be the burnt offering of the future. Okay, if you want to apply that, but you know, I really don't see the, too much of a connection. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. God never provided a lamb, by the way. When you read the rest of the story, did he? And they came to the place which God had told them of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Like I said, there is no resistance by Isaac. Now, I'm sure, and you've heard me teach about this before, Abraham had to tell the stars, recount the story in the heavenlies. And I'm sure Abraham passed that information to Isaac. So you really think about it. We always hear about God tests Abraham. <laughs> you really want to put a common sense application to it. The bigger test was Isaac. He was the guinea pig. He was the lamb that was being led to slaughter. Now, they both believed and trusted God that, I believe, death would not have the final victory and he would come back to life. Because as God promised, someone had, would have to come from the live, lineage that would be the Savior of this world. 
And that couldn't happen if he stayed dead. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. I bet she was kind of glad to hear that voice. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. He saw that Abraham, and that's the significance of the burnt offering, is showing that you're willing to be of service and serve God. Let me just read you something about the burnt offering. Now, what is the typical meaning of the burnt offering? It is clearly not an offering for sin, for that is made in the, made in this, in the sin offering. The meaning is plain. It typifies the consecration of the offerer, offerer to the Lord. The purpose beautifully expressed in Paul's letter to the Romans. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body or bodies a living sacrifice. Holy without blemish, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. Of course, that's in Romans 12, 1. God wants us to present ourselves as a man volunteers for service, a living sacrifice. Which he wants us in the full vigor and strength of our lives, not when we are mere more dead than alive and unfits for service. The burnt offering was also a type of Christ of whom the apostle writing to Ephesians says, Christ also had loved us and has given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. By accepting him, which I don't like those words, accepting him. But... We'll continue. As our burnt offering, we identify ourselves with him and confess that he died as our substitute. And it goes on. But I don't need to read more than that. It was an offering that was a sweet smell, savor type offering because we, we were presenting ourselves we were not holding anything back from God. And when he saw that, it smelled good to him. Period. Well, there's applications also, but just for the basic of this story. So he took his knife and he stretched forth his hand. He's about to slay his son. The angel Lord came and he said, Here am I. And the angel said, and he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything upon him. For now I know thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, Abraham did that on his own. There's no record of that here in this story that, sa that says that he got instructions from the angel to do that. And, and Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. And it said, to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen, or Jehovah provides. Or the Lord will see or to provide. And the angel of the Lord called upon Abraham out of the heaven second time and, he, and said, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord, because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young man and they rose up and went together to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt at Ber 
Sheba. Let me read you something else. Concerning the Armo Utud. Let's me. God told him to look behind him where he saw an image similar to the one he may have seen as a child growing up. That ran in a thicket. Hmm. Where many children were similarly sacrificed. He saw the image of Marduk, or as is known in the Akkadian language, Armu. Armar Utu, which means the calf of Ut, the sun god, or the young bull of the sun. Arma Utu, it means more than that, by the way. I already gave you the earlier definitions. Arma Utu would fit the Hebrew word aval, which translated is rendered as a ram, but could also be rendered as a young horn bull. The god Utu is often pictured with horns. Many children were sacrificed to this god during this time of drought and famine in hopes that a young bull of Utu would provide rain. So, when Abraham took the ram or young bull and sacrificed it instead of his son, he was putting to death, so to speak, the pagan god Armo Utu. See, God would not have him sacrifice his son. God was testing not only Abraham but Isaac if they would hold anything back towards him. That's the bigger test. And they were very familiar, both of them, especially Abraham, about the uncommonality of sacrificing people. He might not have liked it. He might have wished that God would have chosen a different method or avenue. But he trusts God enough to be obedient because he knew that through his lineage, and his lineage could not die out, and that means Isaac would have come back to life, and that's what you read in the New Testament. How Abraham felt, even though if he would have slain his son, he would come back to life, and the promised seed would come through Isaac's lineage, through Jacob and down the line. And another thing that bugs me about this offering, he has no instructions from the angel about that ram in the thicket. Think about it. After hearing what the angel said, I knowest thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me, he doesn't hear any other instructions until the angel of the Lord in verse 15 once again said something the second time. But in between that, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for short for a burnt offering instead of his son. Something puzzled me about that verse. How come here in this story, you think it, it, this is where it should be? Just the impact of this story. that it would mention that God saw that as a sweet-smelling savor offering. But it's not mentioned here. You go back to Genesis 8, when you see a sacrifice. After Noah comes out of the ark, what happens? It 
And he sent forth a raven, and of course we know that, and the raven, and then they finally leave the ark. And God says in Genesis 8 to Noah, go forth. In verse 16, out of the ark, go with thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. And bring forth every living thing that's with thee, and that's what he does. And then in verse 20 it says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offering, offered a burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. Noah's offering was a sweet-smelling offering to the Lord. Think about it. Noah offering his body in servitude to God whom he worshipped and was obedient to. But Abraham didn't get that distinction. Why? I could go to other areas and show you where that distinction is made also. And probably one of the most unbelievable stories in the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament, it doesn't get that distinction when that burnt offering was offered. Why? Why was not a sweet smell, smelling offering? Now Abraham still gave God the credit that he provided an animal and he named that place Jehovah Jireh. Why? Could it be, so to speak, the pagan god Armo Utu, the god of Abraham's youth that he heard so much about, is what was being sacrificed, that young bold horn that was caught in the thicket, or ram, or whatever it was, horn animal, that represented Armo Utu. And doing so, Abraham's declaring his complete lo loyalty to God, Jehovah, that revealed himself to him. Now, God was declaring that he was a God that demanded no human sacrifice of a child or a person to obtain life or eternal life, but instead he would offer his own begotten son as a sacrifice to bring life to Abraham, to Isaac, to you, to me. Now, just as Utu, if you know the history of that false god, demanded the sacrifices of his one sons in order to grant life, God also demanded the sacrifice of a son, but it only would be his son. To to grant not only life, but eternal life. That's what has bugged me for many decades now, really. Why was this not a sweet-smelling offering? really thinking about it. This is one burnt offering in the Old Testament that God does not declare was a sweet-smelling offering to him. Was Abraham sacrificing this horn bull to put to death the Armo Utu
Remember, his father, even leaving Ur and traveling to Haran, which he stayed there, and he didn't really follow God's directions and immediately go to the land of promise, but stay there until his father's death. And Haran became a, probably even more so than even Ur, a place of worshiping false god, bowing down to many false different idols, including Amar Utu. Was this Abram's way of saying, I follow the only true God, Elohim, Jehovah, and Amar Utu is dead to me. Remember, God had to remind him in Genesis 15 to retell the stars, to retell the story. We don't know everything that in Abraham's life and the ups and downs and the times that he questioned, the times that he wasn't sure about what to believe in. His own wife laughed at the possibility of having children at that old of an age. You read these stories without any flesh and blood in them. Now, the way I see it, but besides all the typical applications of what Christ would do for us in this story, in the future, you have to ask yourself why the sacrifice was not a sweet-smelling offering to God. Yes, Abraham credited God providing it, but was God providing a horned animal that symbolizes Armo Utu so Abraham could put it to rest in his life from that point on because he proved to God that he would be loyal and obedient to him only. Which he did. And therefore, he laid the rest the notion of ever considering any other God by putting the most prominent God, which was an extension of the moon God, to rest in his life. Now, can I tell you, and I'll be honest with you, am I 100% sure that is the application for this story that is 100% correct? No. But I'm telling you, there's some strange coincidences throughout this story that just didn't add up for me. I believe the story happened, don't get, don't get me wrong. I have trust and confidence that God's word is true. This event did take place. But just what, what just bothered me was just the simple application that was put on this story, which I believe it's true too, because they have the dual applications here was not enough to explain certain reasons why things just don't show up in this story. For one, why this sacrifice was not considered a sweet smell offering to God. Now, do I believe that Ramnath Thicket re represented Abraham's fame? No, I don't. But that's what's being told out there for the people that actually look into these matters. I think it goes a little bit deeper than that. I think it does represent, because they were famous in putting at guard in their burial sites these false gods to protect them from in the afterlife, in the underworld. And Armo Utu was a very famous false god of that time. 
that came through the extension of the moon god that created the sun god that is the mastermind of all false gods. Maybe someday, not in this series, I would like to go through all the false gods of history. And there's many of them. And line them up in a timeline chronology of how all these false gods really is nothing more than an extension of the moon god, including the sun god. Now, if you find this interesting, fine. Is it going to shake your faith? No. But I'm saying we need to read more into this story than just a simple application that's given to us. Things are not all that it's lined up to be in a simple application of how it's represented through preachers and authors and commentaries. There's more to it than meets the eye. And I'm not trying to be funny there either. I do agree with this particular person. So when Abraham took the ram or young bull and sacrificed it instead of his son, he was putting to death the pagan god Armo Utu to the god of his youth and declaring his complete loyalty to the god Jehovah that revealed himself to him. Now, I'll pick up at this point next time. Now I want to hear from you.